All right, you don't have to keep your Bibles open there in Acts 27. We are going to come back to that passage later on. Uh, but for now, can you please go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And uh, we're continuing our series on the armor of God, putting on the whole armor of God so we can stand in a wicked day, so we can be soldiers for God, so we can be effective in this spiritual warfare that we find ourselves in. And while you turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, let me just read to you the portion of Scripture once again that has to do with the whole armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so we're up to the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Now, I don't know what you think about this, brethren. I remember when I was a child. I remember being a, just, a, just a young man reading my Bible, seeing the whole armor of God. You hear a lot of good preaching about this topic. But it never really, it never made sense to me why I have to have this helmet of salvation, okay? And the reason I was a little confused on this as a young man is because I was thinking about that, I thought that this had to do with your, the soul's salvation. I thought this had to do with, with getting saved and, and going to heaven, that kind of salvation. In actual fact, you know, the salvation that's been referred to here is basically any kind of deliverance, okay? Yes, you can apply it to salvation of your soul, but most, most, you know, well, actually, when you think about this, this is a believer who's been asked to put on the whole armor. Okay, so you're already a believer. You know, whether you've got that helmet on or not, you're saved. Okay, and so, you know, uh, and the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to uh, stand against the wiles of the devil. And so if you think the helmet of salvation is your soul salvation, then you can see why some people might take this passage and teach that you can lose your salvation. Right? You've, you, you know, you can take it off. You've got to make sure you put it back on, right? If you take it off, you're not saved. You've got to put it back on, now you're saved. You take it off, you're not saved. You put it back on, you're saved. And before you know it, you're teaching a workspace salvation, right? And so having a misunderstanding of what the salvation here is uh, can get you into bad doctrine, okay? So that's obviously when you talk, read the Bible and you see the word salvation or saved, it's not always about the salvation of the soul. In fact, we're going through Psalms right now. How many times do we see, you know, salvation or deliverance, right? Uh, King David, one of the main, main psalmists, is already saved. And often he's speaking about the salvation against his enemies. Or he finds himself in a bad place, in a bad spiritual place, and he's asking for deliverance, you know, in, in our lives. And so, you know, we are people that are saved. And of course, you know, in Ephesians 1.1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. And so, if the book of Ephesians is written to the saints in Ephesus, are they already saved? Absolutely, they're saved. That's why they're called saints, right? They've been sanctified. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They've called upon the name of the Lord. And so, believers are being told to put on the helmet of salvation. Okay? Now, you're already saved. Once saved, always saved. Praise God. There's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. That's why it's called eternal life. It's called everlasting life. Because if you could finish tomorrow, it wouldn't be eternal. It wouldn't be everlasting, right? Just by definition, the words everlasting and eternal means that it's once saved, always saved. And so then, if this is for the believer, this is part of our spiritual fight, part of our spiritual armor, what is the helmet of salvation exactly? What, what, what is that uh, aspect? And that's why I ask you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and look at verse number 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and of course, we know these chapters very well. It's about the second coming of the Lord. We know that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is about the day of the Lord, which is the day that the rapture takes place. And then it says in verse number 6, notice this. It says, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunk in the, ni in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Now notice this. Putting on the breastplate of faith, and love, now notice this, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Okay, the hope of salvation. So why is this important? Well, you know, he's talking about the end times. And of course, we know that at the end, in the end times, believers are going to go through great tribulation. You know, there's going to be great persecution for the people of God. And so we're looking forward to the day of Christ. We're looking forward to the coming of Christ. And so when he's speaking about putting on the, the helmet, the hope of salvation... You know, this is speaking about, yes, that you are going to be saved, you are going to be delivered, because we know that immediately after the tribulation, that the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. 
and he delivers us from the tribulation. In fact, he comes back and gives us those new resurrected bodies. The rapture takes place. So the hope of salvation, practically speaking, in this passage is the rapture. Of course, the previous chapter is all about the rapture, right? So we understand what this is talking about now. This is talking about just being delivered from hardship, being delivered from difficulties. Look at verse number 9. What delivery is this? It says verse number 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. What about salvation? Again, the rapture, the salvation of the physical body, that we're going to be delivered from great tribulation, right? Where We're not going to go for the wrath of God. To obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. And so I think 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 gives us a better definition, a better explanation of what the helmet of salvation is. Okay? It's the hope of salvation. Now, brethren, one of the spiritual you know, uh, pieces, the helmet that you must put on, is just hope in God's deliverance. Okay? Yes, in the rapture. Yes, but you know what? You know, as, as I've been preaching through the book of Psalms, we'll find ourselves in difficulties. We're going to find ourselves in trials, in hardships, and what's going to get you through that is the hope of salvation. It's the hope of deliverance, knowing that God's going to come through and help me in this time of trial. That's what this is about, okay? And so when we're going into spiritual warfare, when we're going to fight, you know, pretend that you're a soldier, right? You're, you're being sent out by, by, you know, the army. You're, you're going to fight a war. There are bullets flying past. You know, you're afraid of your life. Am I going to be delivered, Lord? Am, am I going to die? Am I going to succeed in this battle? Well, what we have as believers is the hope of salvation. We, have, we know that the Lord's going to hear us. The Lord can deliver us. You know, that we're in His hands. And listen, whether we wake or sleep, whether we're dead or alive, we're going to be with the Lord. We have this hope of His deliverance. This is something that the unsaved world do not have. Okay? But as Christians, if you don't put the helmet on, then you can lose hope. You know, when you're going through difficulties, when you're going through hardships, when you're going through a spiritual warfare, if you don't have the hope of salvation, you don't have that helmet on, then you're going to find yourself really struggling. You're going to find yourself getting downcast. You're going to find yourself maybe even getting angry with God. God, where's your hand of deliverance? Where's your hand of salvation in my trials? Now, if you can please go to the uh, previous chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because what the Bible's telling us here, brethren, is that as soldiers... We have hope, all right? We have hope that God will deliver us. But the unbeliever, the Bible says, has no hope, okay? No hope. Let me give you some examples of this. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.11, Wherefore remember that ye been in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, hey, before you were saved, it says here, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And without God in the world. So the unbeliever, the Bible says, has no hope. He's without God in this world. You know, the unbeliever goes through the same trials that you do. They go through the same sicknesses, the difficulties that you go through. But they have no hope. They have no deliverer. They don't have God in this world. And so the helmet of salvation is to bring to our remembrance that we have a mighty God who will deliver us through hardships. I mean, that's such a benefit, right? Just to know that God is our Savior. He is our deliverer. And so, you know, before you were saved, the Bible says you're a stranger without God. You, were, you had not entered into any covenant with God. You had no hope. You're a stranger. You're, you're, you're without God in this world. All right? But you're at, you're at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look at verse number 13. So before leading into the passage on the rapture, you know, uh, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the Thessalonian church, and they were a little bit upset because they had lost some loved ones, you know, they had passed away. And he writes this in verse number 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. He writes, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, or those that had passed away, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Okay, no hope. So what is he saying? He's saying the unbelieving world, the unsaved, have no hope. You know, when they lose a loved one, they have no hope, they have no confidence that they're going to see them again. Okay? 
But he says, look, we as believers, we as Christians, when our, when our, our saved loved one passes away, when someone in our church passes away, hey, we have hope. We don't have to mourn like, yes, we can mourn. Nothing wrong with mourning. That's important. But we don't have to mourn like the others that have no hope. So, brethren, even when you're mourning for a loved one, you know, in specifically here, a saved loved one, we have an advantage. We have a huge advantage over the unbelieving world, you know? And uh, because the hope there is the rapture, the hope there that we're going to see them again, all right? Not just some spiritual realm. We're going to see them physically at the rapture when they receive their new resurrected bodies. They're going to be risen up first, and then we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds, you know? And, and we'll be able to see our saved loved ones again. And so there's that hope, right? The hope, the, the world doesn't have hope. The, the world uh, is without God, and, and, the, and the world has no hope of a resurrection, we have that hope. We know this isn't the end. We know there's, there's a future ahead of us, a really exciting future for us. And if I can get you to turn to, um, please go to uh, Titus chapter 3. Go to Titus chapter 3. And while you're turning to Titus chapter 3, I'm going to read to you from Jeremiah 18. You go to Titus chapter 3. <clears throat> because having this hope of salvation... This hope of deliverance is going to drive you to live a certain way, okay? And we're going to go through those, those points shortly, but I'm going to read to you from Jeremiah 18, verse 11. This is God speaking to a backslidden Israel. So for those sitting at the back, backslidden, this is for you, all right? Jeremiah 18, verse 11. It says, <laughs> Now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. So God's planning to do them evil. But then he says this, Return ye now everyone from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. He says, look, just get it right. Get it right with me before I do evil on you, right? And this is how they respond. And they said, this is backslidden Israel, there is no hope. That's what they say. I'll read verse number 12 again. And they said, there is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices and we will, everyone, do the imagination of his evil heart. All right? So when we have this hope of salvation, we have a hope of deliverance, look, God is saying, I'm going to come down and bring evil upon you. I'm going to come and bring judgment and wrath upon you. Just get it right. Just get right with me. Just stop doing the evil. Stop doing wicked things. And so what this, this hope does for us, brethren, as saved believers, it gives us hope of a righteous life. Knowing that God is patient with us, He doesn't want to chastise us, He doesn't want to bring swift judgment, He wants to give us time, okay? This hope of salvation, instead of being destroyed in our sins, God's given us time. We have hope that He's going to deliver us from these struggles, these sinful, wicked devices that we have in our hearts, in our minds, in our hands. God's given us the opportunity to turn from those things. Hey, we have hope in that, right? But the backslid in Israel says, there's no hope. I'm just going to keep doing sinful things works. I'm just going to keep living this way. And so, listen, we, we, we ought to be excited and, and know that God can deliver us, even when we're in a state of backslidden, uh, wicked sins in our lives, you know, that God can bring us deliverance. God can bring us salvation. And that's going to cause you to live a righteous life, to be able to turn from those wickedness when you know that God's judgment is going to come down swiftly upon you if you don't turn from those things, all right? So, you know, the helmet of salvation is not primarily about the salvation of your soul, as I said, right? It's about our daily life as a Christian. We can apply it, in a sense, for that. And so, you know, positionally, positionally, you know, we are as good as being in heaven right now. Just, just right now, you're saved. It's just, in God's eyes, it's like you're in heaven already. You should just count yourself as in heaven. The new man has already entered the kingdom of God, okay? But that's our position, all right? There is still a process, I'm not talking about a process to be saved, all right, but a process that will eventually give us a complete salvation, and as I've already covered, what does that look like? That's the resurrection, the salvation of the flesh, the resurrection of this dead body, right, giving us a new body, that's still a future thing to come, and so when you talk about the hope of salvation, this is more in relation to time, as we go through time, as we live our lives in hope of deliverance, which ultimately will conclude with the resurrected body at the rapture. All right, so you're in Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5. I just want to show you this, the position and the, uh, 
the relation to time, salvation in relation to time, okay? In relation to a process that is still happening in our lives, okay? And I know I, know I hesitate to say that because... You know, when people talk about a process of salvation, they're talking about, you know, well, you, know you believe, now you've got to turn from your sins, and you've got to get baptized, and you've got to keep living a clean life, and whatever it is, you know, people tell that people do know. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the process that will lead us eventually to have that fullness of salvation, which is the resurrected body, okay? Look at Titus chapter 3, verse number 5. It says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Past tense. Are you saved today? Absolutely. That's our position, right? Our position, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now notice this, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Hey, are we hoping for eternal life? Yeah. But do we have eternal life now? Yeah, we do. We have eternal life right now because we're saved, but we're also hoping for that eternal life because we know that that new body's coming. We know that the millennium's coming. We know the new heavens and the new earth are coming. And we're hoping for that fullness of salvation to come. Okay, so there's those two elements, right? The, the position and our walk or the time that, that it takes for us to have that complete salvation. And so when we talk about the helmet of salvation, it's got more to do with that period of time, that process that will eventually lead us to the resurrected bodies, you know, being with Christ forever. Now, if you can, please go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. So now I'm going to go through five points. So five advantages or five points that this uh, helmet of salvation gives us, okay? If we know we're in difficulties, we have a hope that God will deliver us. Okay, what are five advantages that we have as a Christian? Psalm 119, maybe not advantages, just five points relating to this topic, okay? Psalm 119 and verse number 81, verse number 81, give you a moment to turn there because it's a big psalm, right? Verse number 81, point number one is that the helmet of salvation will draw us to his word, all right? It will draw us to his word. How do I know I have the helmet of, of, of salvation on? Well, are you being drawn to his word? This is, this is the first thing you'll notice. Look at verse number 81. It says, My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Now, what salvation is this talking about? Okay, my soul fainteth for thy salvation. Is that the salvation of the soul? No, the psalmist is saved, right? So he's going through some difficulty, he's going through some hardship, or maybe he's just considering the end result, the resurrected body, and he says, because of that, he hopes in the word, right? Go to verse number 147. Verse 147. Same Psalm, 147. It says, I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried, I hoped in thy word. Do you see that the psalmist looks at the word of God and says, look, this gives me hope. When I read the word of God, it gives me this hope of this salvation to come. This deliverance to come. And brethren, that's what the helmet does. It drives us to the Word of God so we can be hopeful for a future, you know, for a deliverance, for some help of God in our lives. Go to uh, verse number 166. Verse number 166. Same Psalm. 166. It says, Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. Okay, I have hoped in thy salvation and done thy commandment. So we know he wants salvation. He's hoping for this. He knows God can deliver me. And he goes, well, you know what? He drives me to his word because it's through his word that I can get this hope. All right, this hope of salvation. And of course, once you dig into the word of God, you know his commandments much better. You know what God wants from you. And so then you can keep his commandments. You can do the commandments that God is asking you to do. So point number one, I won't harp on this point because we, part of the fruits of the Spirit, of course, is, um, sorry, the armor of God is the sword of the Spirit, the word of God. So we'll move on for that. But the point number one is that the helmet of salvation will draw us to his word. Okay, and the word, of course, is the sword of the Spirit. We'll cover that uh, next time. Now, please... I should have told you to stay in Titus. If you can go back to Titus, go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Point number two is that the helmet of salvation will motivate us to purity. 
to live a pure life, to live a clean life, okay? The hope of salvation will draw us to live a life of purity, okay? Now, the Bible says in 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now look at verse number 3. It says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So do we have a hope of salvation, a hope of this resurrection of life? Yes, we do. We know we're going to be like Him. All right? And we know that Jesus Christ is pure. And that's why it says there in verse number 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as He is pure. So when we think about the, 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 the truth that we're going to have new resurrected bodies, we're going to be like Jesus, we're not going to have struggles with sin anymore, that should drive us, right, to live a pure life, to live a righteous life, to get the sins out of our life, the hope of salvation, the helmet. And so this is how you know whether you've got the helmet or not. All right, number one, does it draw you to the Word of God? Number two, does it cause you to desire to live a, a pure life? Now look, you know, I'm not saying that the, you've got it on if you only live a pure life, because none of us live a 100% pure life, right? We all struggle with sin. We're all trying to fight this battle in our flesh. But having that helmet of salvation, knowing what's going to happen in the future, that we're going to have these pure bodies like Jesus will draw us to live a pure life. You're in Titus chapter 2, verse number 11. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Okay, now notice this. So, bringeth salvation, the grace of God bringeth salvation. Teaching us that. What's it teaching us? That denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Okay? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope. What's the blessed hope? The hope of our physical salvation, the salvation of the flesh, the resurrection, the coming of Christ. And it says, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at this. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Look at this. And purify. There it is, the purity. He's going to help you purify. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And so when you've got the hope, the helmet, the hope of salvation on you, it's going to draw you, drive you to live a pure life, drive you to purity, looking for that blessed hope. You know, with the help of Jesus Christ, He wants to purify unto Himself a peculiar people. That's what makes you peculiar, by the way. Okay? What makes you peculiar is you living a pure life, standing out from the world. That's what makes you peculiar. Oh man, I thought what made me peculiar was believing all the controversial doctrines. No, that's not what makes... You know, you can, you can believe all those controversial doctrines about reprobates or, you know, you know, uh, well, you know what else is there? Replacement theology, that's pretty controversial. But you can still live a very wicked and dirty life. That's not making you peculiar. What, what should be making you peculiar is you living a pure life, a pure life, a righteous life, a good life that's different from the wickedness of this world, Okay. And so the, the hope of salvation, remembering Jesus will give me his body, a body just like his, I'm going to be just like him for the power of his resurrection. Well, Lord, I'm not going to wait for that day. I want to live like that now. I want to live like that today. Why should I wait for that time? If God's given me that power, God given me the new man. I've got this wicked filth. He wants to have a peculiar people. I better start cleaning up. Why? Because I have a hope of salvation. Okay? that helmet of salvation, that deliverance to come. Okay, so the helmet of salvation will motivate us to purity. That's point number two. Point number three, and this is where we can go back to the book of Acts now. Let's go to Acts 27, where the reading was from. Acts chapter 27. And I think this is my main point. I've got five points, and this is probably on my main point, okay, uh, out, of, out of the five points. Acts chapter 27. So as Brother Jason was reading Acts chapter 27, toward the end of the book of Acts, this is after, you know, <clears throat> Paul, uh, well, you know the story, Paul gets arrested. I don't know if you all know the story. He gets arrested and eventually he's getting brought into Rome to stand before Caesar 
And so he's on a journey on the ship, you know, with some other prisoners. He's a prisoner himself and other, you know, the, the ship captain and, and uh, sailors and all that. Anyway, they hit some rough, rough seas, all right? They hit some rough seas and they get into a shipwreck, all right? So let's pick up the story here in verse number 18, Acts chapter 27 and verse number 18. And actually, before we read that passage, let me just read to you from Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25. Let me just read it to you. It says this, The Lord is good unto them that wait for Him, to the soul that seeketh Him. Then it says this in verse 26, It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Okay. So what this is saying is, when we're going through some difficulties... All right? And we're like, God, can you please hurry up and save me? Can you please hurry up and deliver me from this difficulty? The Bible says it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Listen, the salvation of the Lord will come. Okay? You don't have to get, you know, don't be impatient. Just be patient. Just wait and hope for that salvation. And like I said, this is not just the resurrection. This is any kind of difficulty you're going through. All right? Anything. Any trouble you're going through, whether it's some financial trouble, whether it's relationships, whether it's sicknesses in your body, whether it's just being downcast and depressed and having great burdens upon you, whether it's fear of this coronavirus or whatever else, whatever might be bothering you, whatever might, you know, difficulty you might be going through, the solution is just understand that God's going to deliver you, that God's your Savior. You know, wait for the Lord, be patient for His deliverance. And so we see a practical example of this in the book of Acts. Acts 27, verse 18, talking about the shipwreck here. And it says in verse number 18, And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighted the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, look at this, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Okay, so they're going through this, this, you know, bad weather, you know, this, 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 this shipwreck. And they say, look, we've not seen the sun nor the stars. I mean, it's been overcast this whole time. You know, it's been raining, it's been storming this whole time. We can't even see the sky. And they get to the point after three days where they're just like, they've lost all hope. We're not going to be saved. You know, this is not just talking about Paul. This is about everybody on the ship, you know, that, that, that's lost hope. And brethren, this is the unbelieving world. This is the world without God, without Christ, without, with, with no hope, as the Bible describes for us, right? When they're in a ship like this, when they're being beaten down, when they're being cast down, they don't have the hope that we have, you know, and, and they'll feel that the, the opportunity of being saved has been taken away from them, okay? And this is why people, you know, end up committing suicide or, you know, just doing stupid things with their lives, messing up even more so. They just, they just aren't expecting any salvation from the Lord. It's just easier to just end their lives. And look, Christians sometimes do this. Christians sometimes commit suicide, you know? You know why they do that? Because they didn't have the helmet of salvation on. They, they weren't hoping, they weren't looking for, that, for, for God's deliverance. Maybe they thought He's waiting too long, and they're like, this is, this is, I can't do this. They've taken off the helmet, and they've committed suicide. It's Christians, I, I know some Christians that have committed suicide. It's a sad thing. When we have the Lord... You know, so this is part, this is an important part of our fight, important part of our spiritual fight. Okay, now look at verse number 21. But after long uh, abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and have not loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. Then it says this in verse 22 And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, <laughs> for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. So, hey, who's positive? You know, who's the one who's got, a, who's got hope for salvation? It's the Christian. It's Paul, right? He says, look, we're all going to live. No one's going to die, but we're going to lose a ship. Okay, it's, there's going to be a, a big shipwreck here. We're going to lose a ship, but we're not going to lose any man's life. Look at verse 23. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought unto Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Listen, Paul got the word of the Lord, all right? He got it through an angel, 
And the angel said, look, you're going to be delivered. You'll all be fine. In fact, you know, God says, look, my hand is, is upon you, Paul, so much so that you're going to be a blessing to everyone else on the ship. They're all going to be saved. They're all going to be delivered because of you. Because of you being on this ship. And listen, brethren, that should be the difference between the unbelieving world without the helmet of salvation and us as Christians who have that helmet of salvation, who has the hope of salvation, that knows that we can be delivered even in a physical situation like a shipwreck. Okay? You know, the Lord knows when you're going through some physical trials. But brethren, I know we're probably not all going to find ourselves in a shipwreck. All right? Probably very unlikely. Uh, but we, we, uh, we do struggle in other areas of our life. We do have, uh, you know, situations that are, that are difficult. And, you know, something that, I, uh, that I've observed in, in my, own, my own life, and I don't know, I've observed this with myself and I've observed this with others, is that there are different levels of, of uh, stress, different levels of difficulties that we, we, we have in, our, in, our, in ourselves. You know, the first one might be a very physical difficulty. Right? Maybe, you know, you might work a very physical job, right? You might be like a laborer, you work with your hands, you know, you, you know, you're out in the sun potentially all day long and it's, you know, it's taxing on the physical body, right? But, and, and I've worked some jobs which were very taxing on my body, right? Uh, but what I found is, usually by the time I got home at the end of the day, yes, I was physically tired, but mentally and spiritually I'm fine. I'm doing just fine, you know, just, just mentally and spiritually. And sometimes just, just a good rest, just a good sleep gets you back up and you can get back on your feet. Uh, usually when you, when you just, you know, have some physical stress, you know, on your body. Then I've also worked jobs where it's very, it's taxing mentally, right? You may not be even physically doing, you know, you just sit on a computer the whole time, right? Or, you know, all those hours for eight, 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 nine, ten hours on a computer. You're not actually doing anything physical, but it's just, it's just a mental stress. You know, it's just, you know, coordinating things, trying to make things, sure things are running properly, you know, anticipating, you know, issues and trying to solve problems just mentally. And what I found is when you can, you know, get to a point where you're stressed mentally, that physically, it has an effect on your physical body. You know, like, I, I don't know about you, but I, I've had times I've just been working so mentally where I've just gotten home and like, man, I'm so tired, I need to sleep. What did you do all day? I was just sitting on a computer all day, right? Or something like that. Because, you know, the mental state, if you're stressed mentally, it does have an effect on your physical body, all right? So you have that double whammy effect, you know, um, compared to some of that maybe just works, that labors just physically, but maybe not be so stressed mentally. Okay, so that, that's, that's normal. Most of us will go through some of those uh, challenges. But the worst state you can be in as a Christian is when you're spiritually stressed, when you're, when you're really, when, when you're being attacked spiritually, when you're far from God, when you're backslidden and you just lost hope, you haven't got that helmet of salvation on, you're not expecting God's deliverance in you. And when you're far from God and you're, and you're spiritually stressed, you know what that has? That's an effect on your mental capacity. It has an effect on your physical. Okay, so that's like a triple whammy, right? When you're, when you're far from God and you're just in a bad state spiritually, it has an effect mentally and physically as well. It, it taxes the body. As well, and you know, people understand this. You know, if you stress a lot, if you you know, you can, you can cause ulcers in your body. You can cause certain sicknesses in your body. All right, say so why are you saying all that? <clears throat> because, you know, God's not always going to necessarily deliver you physically. You know, and I know there are some individuals in our in our church. Now, He may do, like we saw with a with a the shipwreck. They needed physical deliverance, and the Lord stepped in and physically delivered them. Okay, but I know there are a lot of people in our church that suffer from you know, uh, sicknesses in their bodies, physical sicknesses in their bodies, right? And, uh, you know, it's very taxing, it's very uh, challenging, it can cause them to eventually struggle mentally or even spiritually. But even if God doesn't see you through and deliver you physically, now, one day He will, at the rapture, <laughs> He'll give you that new body, but you know, one thing that God can deliver you through is mentally and spiritually, okay? So, you can be someone that struggles in the flesh, you know, you have a sickness, you have an ailment, it, it's getting you down, but the Lord may deliver you. That hope of salvation may come in just a good mental state, just in a good spiritual position before God. And so you're still struggling with those things physically, but now you can actually get through it a lot better because God has delivered you, you know, internally. And that's really where it matters because when you're bad internally, it has an effect everywhere else. When you're bad spiritually, it has a bad effect on your mind, it has a better, bad effect on your body, Okay. Now, just another example, of course, is when uh, Israel was being delivered by Egypt. And I'll just read a quick passage, Exodus 14, verse 13. And, you know, Israel, you know, going to the Red Sea. And it says, And Moses said unto the people, in verse number 13, Fear ye not, stand still, 
and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more. Then it says in verse number 14, the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. He says, look, you don't even have to fight. God's going to fight for you. God's going to deliver us physically. And of course, we know the story. He gets him through the Red Sea and the Egyptians all you know, drown. Uh, the chariots all get destroyed, the horses, all that. So, he, you know, God can deliver you physically, right? There can be that kind of deliverance. But quite often, if you can please go to Philippians. Go to Philippians chapter 4. Did I get to turn you anywhere else? No, probably not. Go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Because if you're not being delivered physically and you know, well, I'm, I, my body's deteriorating. This, this is just how, this is a curse on the earth, right? I mean, this is just the fact that we live in sinful bodies, right? That they're breaking down. This is why God promises us the resurrected body in the future. Well, in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6, it says this. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 6. It says, be careful for nothing. It says, don't be full of care. Don't be full of worries, is what the Bible is saying here, right? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. It says, look, are you struggling? Are you worried? Are you stressed? Are you going through some difficulty? Take it to prayer to God, right? Take it to Him. Make your request known unto God. Verse number 7. Now notice this. Now with Moses, he says, look, God will fight the battle and you shall hold your peace. Right? So physically, they don't have to you know, work. Okay? They can be at peace physically. But then there is a peace as well that comes mentally. In verse number 7, it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. You know what that's teaching us? That even if you have a physical ailment, you're struggling physically. You know, I don't know, some disability. You know, people that might be, you know, people who are lame, who can't walk or whatever, you know, it's just, just physically can actually be some of the best people, can be some of the best Christians, can be some of the most happy people, can be some of the people with the most peace. Why? Because they've gone to Jesus. They've cast their worries and their cares upon Him. And yes, He may, he may not have delivered them physically, but He's delivered them mentally, you know, in the heart. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding. You cannot understand the peace of God. The world doesn't understand the peace of God when you have it. When, you, when God has delivered you in that way, right? The hope of salvation. Listen, if, if you think that, you know, I can only be happy, I can only be close to God if I'm physically well, you're missing the point. It all starts spiritually. Hey, you get the spiritual side right with God, you're walking with God, you're close to God, He's going to be able to give you the, the peace of understanding. That passes all understanding. He's going to be able to deliver you in that sense, brethren. You know, uh, please, you're in Philippians, go to verse number one, uh, chapter one, sorry, Philippians chapter one. While you're turning to, to Philippians chapter one, I'll read to you from 2 Thessalonians chapter two, verse 16. It says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which have loved us and have given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Then it says in verse number 17, Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. What is God seeking to deliver you from? From worries, from stress, okay, from... from, from uh, yeah, stress and worries. You know, God's trying to deliver you from that. He wants to comfort your hearts, right? The hope, the good hope through God's grace. And in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 28, it says, The hope of the righteous shall be gladness. Let me read that again. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. Listen, if we are righteous, we're spiritually right with God, we're walking with God. You've got the helmet of salvation on. You got no listen, God, I'm struggling, I've got problems. You may not even physically deliver me from this, Lord, but I know if I'm close to you, you're going to be able to give me peace. You're going to comfort my heart. You know, you're going to give me gladness. You're going to give me joy. You know, instead of being cast down and upset and frustrated in life, you can have the joy. The helmet of salvation, the hope of salvation, the hope of deliverance, you know, is a great arsenal. A, a great uh, arsenal. A great you know, piece of defense, right, in our spiritual fight uh, 
in this world. And so point number three, I don't know if I even said it, let me just go back to it. Point number three is that the helmet of salvation gives peace of mind. Peace of mind, all right? Now, I think, now I don't know if you would agree on this, <laughs> but I think you'd be better off physically struggling with physical issues, but you have the peace of God. You're right with God. You've got the joy of your salvation. You'd be in a better state like that than being well physically, but full of stress, full of worry, far from God, falling away, you know, and, and the Lord's just about to bring that judgment upon you. You're better, you know, you're better off with a bad body, physical body, which, because it's going to be replaced one day with a better one. Don't worry about it, you know, and just walking with the Lord, being close to the Lord, and knowing that the Lord can deliver you mentally from your, from your struggles and your, your stresses that you have. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 18. Point number 4. The hope, sorry, the, the helmet of salvation will give boldness even unto death. <laughs> All right? It will give you boldness even unto death. Philippians chapter 1 verse 18. Uh, let me just give you... So Paul is, is in prison. He's writing to the Philippian church. He's explaining about that he's in bonds, all of this, right? And then in verse number 18 he says, What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Verse number 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So it says, look, if you just keep praying for me, I know you guys are preaching Jesus Christ. I know this is going to turn to my salvation. I know I'm going to be delivered from prison, is what he's saying, right? So it's a very physical deliverance here that he's, that he's hoping for. And then he says in verse number 20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. He says, look, I'm expecting God to deliver me. I'm expecting his salvation. I'm in prison right now. All right, you guys just keep praying. I've got a hope that he's going to deliver me. He says, but you know what? This hope gives me boldness. All right, and look, Christ will be magnified in my body. Whether I get released and go and live, he'll be magnified in my body, or whether I die in prison. God's going to be magnified. I'm going to be a martyr. I'm going to die for Christ, is what he's saying, right? Verse number 21. For to me, for to, me to live is Christ, and to die is gain, right? So man, if I die for Christ, I know I'm, he's, he's hoping in his deliverance. He's hoping in his salvation. Yes, a part of that is prison, but the greater part, the greater gain is the hope of salvation in heaven for him, right? Being with Jesus Christ for, forever. And so you see the boldness he has in prison. Now, I'm sure Paul in prison, had times of being cast down. I'm sure, I'm sure he had that, right? I'm sure, just, he's a normal man, don't forget that, right? You know, sometimes we read about Paul, we think he's a super Christian, of course he was a super Christian, but he's still a man, he still has the flesh, he still has weaknesses and concerns, and you find yourself in prison, you're going to be a little bit cast down, all right? But with the prayer of the saints, we put on that helmet of salvation back on, knowing God's going to deliver me, either physically out of this prison or just in heaven. Right? I'm just going to magnify God. I'm going to have the boldness to just live for Him or to die for Him. And so the helmet of salvation will give boldness even unto death. Because we know where we go when we die. Right? Someone points a gun at your head and says, I'll shoot you if you don't deny Christ. I hope I can be like Paul. <laughs> go, you know, go ahead. For me to die is gain. Make my day. <laughs> Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> all right, and if you're struggling in that area, you've got to put on the hope of, of salvation, all right? The, the helmet, the hope of salvation. All right, let's just start. Uh, we're going to conclude. No, no, we haven't concluded just yet. Please go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm almost done. So I'm up to my fifth point now. My fifth point is this, that the helmet of salvation will keep your eyes on eternal matters. Okay, eyes on eternal matters. The helmet of salvation. Romans chapter 8, verse number 22, reads, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, 
the redemption of our body. Okay, did you know that? Did you know that your body's groaning? You know, you're, like, you may not, I don't know if you realize this, right? But every time you get frustrated because of your sins, right? And you're like, oh man, did I do this? It's your body groaning. You know what the body's saying? Give me that new body. <laughs> the redemption of the body. Give me that body of Jesus that, you know, is like Jesus Christ. And then look at verse number 24. For we are saved by hope. And it's talking about the new body there, right? But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But we hope for that we see not. Then do we with patience wait for it. All right, so we're hoping for this salvation. What he's saying is this. Because we can hope for these things, these things we can't see it now. What do we see now? We see the temple things. We see the carnal things now. You know, we see the earthly, worldly things now. But we're hoping for the spiritual things. We're hoping for eternity. Because we've got that helmet of salvation. We know that we're going to be saved. This body's going to receive the new one, the better one, the sinless one, right? It's going to be great. And so by having this helmet on, this, this hope of salvation to come, it's going to help you focus on the things that you do not yet see. The eternal matters. That's what matters in life, brethren. What can I take into eternity with me? I can take my soul. I can take my children's souls. I can take other people's souls with me. That's all you can take with you. What else can you take with you to heaven? Nothing. Can't take anything. What else can you take? Is there anything else, brethren? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing something. That's all I can think of. You can just take the souls of men with you. You know, and, and, and with, with that hope of salvation, that's going to cause you to just remember eternity. Say, Lord, this is just a temporary place. You know, why should I hope for the things that I can see? I'm going to hope for the things that I, I cannot see. Uh, you know, your, your word has told me, Lord, that you've got mansions in heaven. You have told me that I'm going to serve you and worship you. And, 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 and uh, you know, we'll be resting in heaven, but we'll be also serving him. We'll also be doing some works. I don't know what the projects are in heaven. But listen, it's going to be exciting. It's for all eternity. You know, we're going to have great rewards. We're going to have, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. So, you know, the, the helmet of salvation will keep our eyes on, e on eternal matters. Now, just in conclusion, brethren, I'll just, I'll just repeat those five points and I'll just conclude. Point number one was the helmet of salvation will draw us to his word. Number two, the helmet of salvation will motivate us to purity. Number three, the helmet of salvation gives peace of mind. Point number four, the helmet of salvation will give boldness even unto death. And number five, the helmet of salvation will keep your eyes on eternal matters. Now, just in conclusion, I'll just read it to you. Isaiah 43 verse 10. It says, the Lord speaking here, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Then he says this, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed and there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Brethren, I just wanted to conclude on that because we're talking about the helmet of salvation. There's only one Savior. There's only one salvation. There's only one person that can deliver us. There are many false gods out there. They can't save you. Listen, this world cannot save you. There's only one. There's only one. That's the Lord God. There's only one God. And that's our God. Praise God. The God of the Bible. Jesus Christ, the Father, the Holy Spirit, you know. And the Lord wants us to remember, put on that helmet, all right. It's not your soul salvation because you already got that, okay. That's guaranteed. You can't take that off and put it back on. But when you put on the helmet of salvation, it will give you hope for the future. It will give you hope of deliverance, whether that's a physical, just mental, or just a spiritual deliverance, all right. And let me encourage you, if you're struggling in some of these areas, get the spiritual aspect of your life fixed first, Okay, don't worry about the physicals. Don't worry about the mental stress you're going through right now. If you're far from God, get the spiritual part right first. Get close to God, you know. And if you get close to God, He's going to give you the peace of mind. And then, you know, physically, He may deliver you as well, if that's in the will of God. All right, let's pray.